Good morning, everybody, or wherever you are. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Angela Anderson, and I am the program coordinator for the Epidemic Urbanism Initiative. Today, our panel is titled Health Equity in Architecture at the Intersection of Teaching, Archive, and Curating. This panel is part of the Epidemic Urbanism Initiative's online series of webinars, panels, and interviews. Co-founded in 2020 by Dr. Mohamed Gauripur and Dr. Caitlin D. Clerk, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the EUI works with a global community of scholars, designers, and practitioners to create dialogue around issues related to architecture, space, and their relationship to epidemic diseases. We also work with health equity. The pandemic drew attention to the inequality of healthcare around the world, and the EUI has continued to coordinate panel discussions, publish an edited volume, archive our collection of open source teaching videos, interviews, and other resources that can be used to learn and teach about health and the built environment. The EUI is now a didactic hub, developing and presenting learning materials that focus on the implications of the relationship between various aspects of health, from historical quarantines, to healthy cities and to teaching design and architecture. We have two webinars featuring the 2023 EUI International Design Competition finalists and juries with a focus on adaptive reuse and health equity in localized contexts. We ran the competition in two categories, community health center and emergency treatment center. I would like to draw your attention to these resources on the EUI's website and our YouTube channel, as well as other modules that can be used in the classroom. You can please visit our site or email us at epidemicurbanism at gmail.com. The EUI is fortunate to have a community that includes a board of experts, almost 3,000 learners, practitioners in architecture and healthcare, scholars and professionals, and a team of regional liaisons from five continents. In all, our global approach is based on the contributions of talented people from more than 90 countries. I would like to express our appreciation today as well to the expert panelists joining us, who you will meet in just a moment, and to the chair and moderator, Dr. Meral Kinjiolu, part of the Society of Architectural Historians Historic Interiors Affiliate Group and an accomplished scholar whose analytical work on architectural archives has shed light on the institutional exclusion of women, racialized groups, and other minorities from these documentation systems. I look forward to the discussions today. Thank you all for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online uh, panel. Uh, health equity in architecture at the intersections of teaching, archive, and creating. And uh, as a panel chair, I am Meral Ikinjolo. And um, why health equity in architecture and why at the intersections of teaching, archive, and creating, if you ask? As our global COVID-19 pandemic experience, uh, climate emergency, and uh, other urgent uh, challenges have clearly shown us that if underrepresented minority and disadvantaged communities and individuals are not taken into consideration, it is not enough to provide health opportunities for only some people. In architecture today, we need to re-examine our design understanding and cultures to provide fair health opportunities for everyone within the built environment. And for this, we need to reconnect fragmented domains of architecture. In this respect, the current role of architectural teaching is vital for a positive transformation and for the internalizations of health equity by young students with a holistic perspective. To support this, it is also vital to construct and develop our collective memory on health equity in architecture because some answers to our problems and potential resolutions are hidden in these realms, in other words, in our arch architectural archives and collections. 
With this perspective, our panel today aims to establish and develop productive dialogues among teaching, archival, and curatorial communities. And since health equity in architecture is a broad topic, our panelists are from diverse architectural cultures to offer a rich perspective on this subject. Now, please welcome our esteemed panelists. Dr. Elke Miyadama is a researcher and teacher at Inholland University of Applied Sciences in Netherlands and co-founder of Healthscapes. With an academic foundation, she excels as a researcher and educator focusing on the evolution of healthcare systems and their impacts on health facility design. Dr. Aaron Davis is a lecturer in architecture at University of South Australia with extensive experience in design and facilitations of complex co-design and co-creation processes. He has strong experience in industry-linked teaching with an emphasis on design for health in architecture. And Dr. Nilay Evgil is a full professor in architecture at Beykent University in Turkey. With her 25 years of experience in research and teaching, her major focal points are inclusive design, accessibility, urban design, quality of life in cities and public spaces. She is a leading professor studying and offering her courses on architectural design for all in Turkish architecture and has several published books and essays on her expertise fields. Dr. Julie Collins is a research fellow and creator at the Architecture Museum, University of South Australia. Her interests range from architectural history of therapeutic places to study of architectural drawings, collections, and heritage. Heritage, and her recent books is Architecture and Landscape of Health: A Historical Perspective on Therapeutic Places between 1790 and 1940. And Kadir Uyanuk is a co-founder of Docs Architecture, an accomplished architectural design office in Turkey. Work as an uh, as an instructor for interior design studio at Kültür University in Turkey in Istanbul. Won several national and international architectural competitions. As Docs Architecture, Surgical Instruments and Health Museum in Samsun, Turkey is among their significant projects with their experience in documenting an exhibition on the development of surgical instruments and knowledge of medicine. And after our panelist presentation, we have question and answer sessions and would be happy to know questions by our audiences. And if you would like an answer from a specific uh, panelist, please uh, first write your questions and then mention uh, the panelist name during our question and answer session in our chat box. And now I would like to ask our panelists to, to learn their inspiring experience, challenges and suggestions on our panel subject. According to your experience in the field of uh, teaching or historical documentation and curatorial practice, what would you like to say about substantial gaps in health equity in architecture and what can be done to fill these gaps? And what can be done to develop productive collaborations among teaching, archival, and creatorial communities in architecture to support teaching health equity in architecture? I would like to begin with uh, Elke. Mm, yes, Elke, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, thank you, Miral, uh, for, for having us. Uh, my name is Elke Midema. Uh, you already introduced me, so I can skip to the next slide, I think. Um, here. Yeah, so since 2006, I've been interested in the role of architecture for human health, and I build upon many others who have already showed that the built environment can influence health, what also was already mentioned, but also that the, the built environment can influence health inequalities and, and therefore it becomes of paramount importance that designers and therefore the education uh, pays attention to how the design of spaces, spaces of health care and cure uh, fit for all, regardless of uh, people's abilities, uh, backgrounds, and values. Uh, within the larger domain of research on architecture for healthcare and cure, I focused in building design for the transformation of health, mode of healthcare. 
uh, I refer to the processes of designing buildings that enable vulnerable individuals and communities to take care, uh, to take control over factors that positively influence their health and quality of life. This does mean a very holistic, human-centered approach to design. Uh, it pays attention to health rather than just illness. Um, and it has a very strong social justice and equity component. So this also, it's because it comes, uh, health promotion as a concept comes from public health and the health equity focus. And um, yeah, I just wanna talk to you about a couple of examples of how I'm trying to overcome these gaps between the knowledge of like general architectural education and the directions that we want to go to uh, as part of um, architectural profession to take up health uh, equity. And that of course includes processes of empowerment and participation, but I think Alan will also uh, talk more about a multidisciplinary collaboration. So just a bit background, I, I've been teaching since 2010 uh, in architecture and building engineering. And I worked in the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden in different uh, knowledge institutes, but also in practice uh, in architectural firms on bachelor, master, PhD level um, in courses that involve design for health care and cure. Uh, and I've learned from many before me, of course. So I. I uh, want to acknowledge their uh, share. And what we, on, uh, so whatever time I have, I always start with whoever is in the my educational group, like with the vocabulary surrounding uh, design for health equity. So what do we actually mean with universal design, inclusive design, age-friendly social design? And then I also take them into the discussions that these, words actually vary very much uh, depending on the regions as well and how this is interpreted. And I give them this vocabulary if we only see them shortly so they can leave after a lecture or a seminar and search more information themselves, of course, but also to really get to know and understand the different interpretations of this and what that actually means for design. Um, when we have a bit more time, I will also discuss the, the larger vocabulary surrounding designing for a specific um, target groups. So for instance, uh, do you say I design for disabled people? Uh, I design with people uh, who are disabled or people that have disabilities or people that, so there's, and I still struggle with these words because English is also not my native language. and. Of course, the preferences of how you talk about this uh, change depending on the individuals as well. But we have this discussion in the class to be able to learn how to reflect upon the words that are being used. Uh, what I see as one of the struggles is that there is a whole a domain about design for health equity. And I really tr always try to focus on how do you combine different health focused design aspects. So health equity and health behavior and design for planetary health. And with uh, it, within the education, we also discuss like, okay, what are the different ambitions for each and the strategies and where do they overlap or contradict? This is a, a bit of a strange example, of course, the inclusive design, you, the elevator for people who cannot use the stairs, but you need to take the stairs. And um, this seems to be a joke, but this is, very often happening uh, and with the students uh, within the education we try to show that by knowing the multiple perspectives uh, you can actually find um, symbiosis and, and uh, create uh, spaces that promote physical activity but not just for people who are uh, having a fully functioning um, uh, mobility but also for people who have other uh, forms of mobilities. A large role of that is of course participation, not only to understand the needs of the, uh, of the diverse populations that you're interested in, but also to empower them, to take them uh, as part of, uh, yeah, be a spokesperson, um, yeah, and take them into the processes. And in the education, I often share one of the studies that I did uh, about this hospital in Sweden, where as part of the urban development, where there was a lot of issues with health inequity, 
they used the process of designing a new hospital in the neighborhood uh, as a planning process to uh, involve the people that lived around there and that were often excluded from uh, conversations in general. And for instance, they asked the local population to participate in the development of the, the whole branding, the identity of the new hospital. Um, and in the jury, there were also spokespeople from the communities. And uh, yeah, so the pattern that you see here on the, um, uh, the balcony glass that repeats everywhere in flyers, but also in, in, uh, in facades. Uh, and that's a result of the design competition. It's of course difficult to incorporate such participatory methods in design education. So what we often have done is that the students first emerge themselves with literature to be able to filter out all of the questions that uh, they can already gain from there. Then they can use social media, uh, but they've also used interviews and site visits um, as part to really get to know who they are designing for and understanding their specific needs, wishes and values. And what I'm really proud of is the work that I've done with Birgit, Birgit um, Jurgenhaken in, um, in TU Delft is where the students could actually live sometimes in uh, healthcare facilities and really get to know uh, the people that they were designing for through their face, uh, field work, space and user observations. Then based upon that work, uh, we help them to develop user personas and user journeys. And then this is also something that is very tricky because what often happens if you don't have that uh, data beforehand, then this can become like almost a caricature of the population and a simplification. And throughout a day, a, a seminar, we discuss with the students their personas and the journey and what kind of information they still need to be able to do that in a respectful way. Um, and I think this is also a difficult thing relating to uh, archiving, but also general access to data and health equity um, ethics. Like how do we handle um, yeah, access to data? Um, can, we, can we use the current data? Because it's often says like the elderly where there is no uh, attention to uh, differences between these populations. So the existing research is often doesn't provide a complete image of the, the population that has been involved. It's also difficult to collect your own data with the ethics that you're putting um, upon an, a department that needs to put in um, time, uh, but also the pressure on the healthcare system that we actually do need this. So we need a new ways of archiving this to create more open access data collection and respecting individual time. Um, I just wanna show this that I also collaborated with uh, the Dutch Institute of the, the archive of the Dutch creative industry. And we also worked a bit with, uh, yeah, using more what was archived to show also in the current perspective, how the transition from history to the futures were. Uh, but I'm not so familiar with the archiving. I wanna finalize. Uh, thank you very much. I would love to talk more, but. Uh, more I'm interested in the other uh, panelists today and having the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Elke. And uh, yes, Aaron, the floor is yours. What would you like to say about our panel question? And the, the panel question about the, the, um, uh, the difference of the, the most important difficulties. Uh, and I think that's kind of what I summarized in the presentation. So the difficulty of like, how do we talk about this? How do we discuss these topics with architects? Like, do we have the vocabulary? Uh, but also how do we, yeah, you, you want to involve people. You want to really understand people that you are uh, designing for, but how can you do that in a way without uh, constantly asking uh, much of them, even though they're already, um, yeah, it's more difficult to share their perspectives, uh, etc. So they don't get tired. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. such a fantastic segue into uh, what I'm hoping to share. So thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Morel, and for everybody for uh, your attention. 
Uh, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Ghana country in Australia and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the country in which I am from. Um, in my eight minutes that I did promise, I may go slightly over eight minutes, but uh, I'd like to share three ingredients that I am trying to bring into all of my teaching in this space around health equity, before then providing an example of a model I've developed through an international research project um, that sets up a framework that I think is uh, really useful for trying to educate the next generation of architects as we move forward with the health equity agenda, and then finally having a few um, conclusions about what this might all mean for architectural education and for collaborations, uh, particularly with the archival sector. So the first ingredient uh, is something that I've noticed quite often in the politics of healthcare facilities is um, that healthcare facilities are quite expensive. And this slide provides an interesting provocation, I think, that the Palazzo in Las Vegas and the Shard in London have a few things in common, but one of them is that each cost $1.9 billion. And interestingly, a, a hospital in the city I'm from in Adelaide, South Australia, costs $2.1 billion. So our healthcare facilities are incredibly, incredibly in expensive. And what this uh, is leading to, certainly in an Australian context, is a focus on finding efficiencies and trying to reduce the costs of these buildings. But my argument is often that these efficiencies are an artificial efficiency and our buildings are becoming artificially cheap because we are doing things like I've highlighted down the bottom there of excluding marginalised communities from their design. And that's a cost that we pay as a non-financial cost in exchange for arriving at a lower financial cost. So calling that out is something I'm very keen to do with my students as well as to advocate for politically that it's not okay to exclude our marginalised communities from our health facilities. One of the ways this is enacted uh, in healthcare design is through the use of very strict, stringent uh, design guidelines. So in Australia, we use the Australasian Health Facility Design Guidelines, um, and there are many equivalents around the world. And these design guidelines set a baseline, an absolute minimum standard, uh, but we often defer to that in the name of this artificial efficiency. What's interesting about design guidelines is that they are, are formed in a very different way from clinical guidelines, which are based on huge amounts of data and evidence, while design guidelines are typically based on what did we do last time and was that all right, uh, with very, very little evidence to back that up. Second ingredient is about... Uh, how we engage with our communities when we are engaging them. And one of the challenges that I often see, uh, particularly around architectural projects engaging with marginalised communities, is a resistance to the idea of giving over decision-making power to a minority group or to a smaller group. And I always counter that with this idea that um, there are different types of engagement that we do. And this is an example I use with health practitioners that you're not going to engage somebody in a decision about what scalpel a surgeon should use or where they should start and end an incision to do a surgery, but you are wanting to engage them in whether surgery is the right option. So some work I commenced in my PhD studies and have continued is around this idea that we can uh, engage with people in a dialectic manner, which is very focused on outcomes. This is uh, stems out of Hegel's work and philosophy or we can engage in a dialogic collaboration, which is focused on high quality processes and finding insights all along the way, rather than being obsessed with decision-making or outcomes. Uh, a couple of years ago, we published an initial framework that was setting out to test when is it okay to give less control over outcomes, but to engage in deeper processes? And when is it required that people do have control over the outcomes when you are engaging these processes? Um, as a reference to the paper, but essentially this area highlighted in pink, we argue should not be done. Uh, but everything above that line, there are instances that we've uh, explored where it might be okay to do those sorts of approaches. Third ingredient uh, is about changing our perspective on how we engage. And this is something that is challenging to bring into the classroom. Um, but through research work, we're looking very much at 
Uh, how do we start from our participant group rather than uh, our own convenience? So working through a spatiotemporal framework in this instance to define what might work for our participants. This has been really uh, interesting through the pandemic because uh, as this quote illustrates, uh, this was uh, Dion Detterer who uh, lives with uh, muscular dystrophy. And uh, his quote here that it's the first time he's felt like an equal participant was from a fully online engagement. And this really challenged us to think that perhaps our same time, same space or our face-to-face co-design workshop wasn't actually working for everybody. It's working for generally white, middle-class, wealthy people who can spare a couple of hours during the day, but may not be working for some of our more marginalised communities. So uh, we really try to uh, explore different options for how we might engage people in the evenings, on weekends, in their place of residence, uh, and at different uh, through different modalities as well. So to illustrate a bit more about these ingredients, I thought I'd just share a project that I've been uh, working on for about the last four years or so, which is the Neuroscience Optimized Virtual Environments Living Lab. It's an example of how healthcare architecture might be done in a different way. I have a number of project uh, partners and collaborators there. I do want to acknowledge uh, this is uh, the lead research team. It's quite a large team um, and there are many more other people. We have 104 co-researchers involved in this project. We also have a fantastic steering committee with some names those familiar with healthcare architecture may remember around the world. But in this project, we, we ran a series of online workshops because of the pandemic, uh, but this opened up a huge number of uh, new participants to us that wouldn't otherwise have had the opportunity to participate, and um, particularly a lot of our stroke survivor community because this project is focused on the design of subacute rehabilitation post-stroke. Um, we discovered that these online workshops we were creating back in 2020 could also be used asynchronously. So we could provide people with more time and to, uh, the opportunity for people living with aphasia, as an example, to spend time with a communication partner working through this at a pace that worked for themselves, something we've never been able to do with our typical mode of running a workshop. We ran both virtual and physical drop-in spaces to allow people to come past and have a discussion about the project, make their contributions again at times that suited them and through the virtual hub at uh, a location that suits them by opening up participation to people, particularly in regional and remote Australia. Of course, there were the obligatory face-to-face -face workshops, which we all love, uh, and the opportunity to, to come together is still a really valued part uh, of projects like this one. But we also found some value coming out of hybrid uh, workshops and the ability for people to have some asynchronous follow up after the event. Uh, and particularly it was those who come from our stroke survivor community or those who are typically more marginalized in the processes that were engaging more through uh, the, uh, those hybrid and asynchronous modalities. So the outcomes from this project are a whole series of designs uh, in a gaming engine, uh, new ideas for services, and ideas for how we integrate these together. But what's really uh, critical and something we're keen to educate our students on is going beyond a binary notion of which is better. Um, so we've uh, looked at these two examples and we all kind of gravitate toward the Netherlands example here, um, but how to actually generate some evidence on this is a question we've been grappling with. Um, so treating them as a soup problem or as bowls of soup and not trying to actually identify individual ingredients, but to look at them as a whole and to be able to compare things as a whole enables us to do a much more holistic and and a much better evaluation. So we used value-focused thinking to determine what it is we should be evaluating uh, these facilities based on and what the objectives might be when we design spaces. Um, and all of this is available as some really great inputs for uh, design studios as some really nice challenges to set students. Um, things like uh, how can you maximise access to a positive and stimulating environment or maximise outdoor and green spaces, maximise versatility, those types of things. So in summary, um, I think we need to teach our architecture students what healthcare design guidelines are and are not, um, and particularly to call out where they are just seeking uh, economic efficiency. 
um, teach students how to ask appropriate questions and how to value long-term engagement that's not focused on decisions, how to construct and deliver value to marginalised communities by uh, taking a participant-centric engagement practice. And then when we reach out to our archival and curatorial communities, I think we could really um, contextualise a lot of what we're doing and understand where these standards have come from, um, because a lot of them just appear to have come from thin air, but there is a long history that has led to them being the way they are. Um, I think we can enrich our dialogues um, and bring examples from beyond current experience into our engagement with communities and hopefully over time demonstrate how our social, political and cultural contexts are manifest through our healthcare facilities and services. So apologies for the very well wind, but hopefully that gives you a, a snapshot into the kind of work um, that I'm interested in and what we try to bring into our studios uh, down in Australia. Thanks, Aaron, for this uh, very informative presentations uh, on our panel questions. And now, uh, Nilay, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Meral, and uh, thank you for this organization. Um, my name is uh, Ayşe Nida Ece from Istanbul Beykent University, Turkey. Uh, I teach uh, universal design uh, courses to um, in my department to uh, architecture students and interior architecture stu students as well. Uh, I begin to my... Uh, to my uh, lectures with uh, Brian Lee Jr.'s uh, words. He says that for nearly every injustice in this world, there is an architecture, a plan, a design that has been built to sustain it. Then uh, I asked to my, co uh, to my students, then uh, can you describe me who is a, a disabled people, person? Um, they try to describe uh, or um, uh, give a, a, the answer as um, describing a people who is using a wheelchair or who is using a, a crutch um, or a white can. Um, but uh, after this um, uh, answer, I, I, I explain that actually there is no disabled people but there is uh, people who are um, uh, architectural disabled i mean disability can be removed by improving improving the uh, interaction of people with the built environment and then i introduce uh, them with the uh, concept of inclusive design by the way, uh, the um, uh, previous uh, speakers, I can Aaron uh, explain uh, the the concept, but uh, I, I sometimes use um, the same uh, word as inclusive design or design for all or universal design as the same meaning. Um, so, in a short, in a very short uh, explanation, I can say that. The concept, inclusive design concept, is the design of products and environment to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So as we designer or as we architect, uh, we can and we should make our world as accessible and as usable as possible for diver diverse users. In my uh, lessons, I try to uh, give my uh, students a wider view to gain a deeper understanding of the user's context, pain, needs, wants, and uh, the concept about uh, what is normal. Uh, the the um, the reply is uh, lying on the uh, universal concept i believe therefore i uh, i told them uh, universal design is the liberation for everyone 
if I can, is if I can, I come close to health equity, which is today's topics. Uh, I may also say that health equity is a broad, complex, uh, broad and complex topic as well, like universal design. But I can define simply as having a fair opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Uh, as you consider, uh, health is uh, also affected by environmental factors such as physical and information access. Uh, these factors can be either facilitate or uh, can be uh, either uh, create a barrier. From my point of view, inclusive design in architecture contribute to our health and well-being through accessible buildings, spaces, and uh, transportation vehicles is uh, widely acknowledged. Um, in other words, uh, inclusive design can be the catalyst for equity in our building spaces and communities uh, of tomorrow. And um, there are several shared goals uh, and design strategies among health and inclusive design initiatives. Uh, if I can uh, give some uh, uh, details, some example, uh, I can tell improvements upon ergonomics. Physical and mental health and safety not only serve to create healthier environments, but I can also say that they, co they can contribute to better spaces for everyone. Another example uh, can be taken from design strategies such as exterior pedestrian amenities, interior circulation pads, adjustable seat and stand workstation, and spaces for physical fitness that include options for people of all abilities, um, which uh, greatly enhance the opportunity to improve physical health. In my lessons, um, I try to um, create empathy. So what is empathy? Empathy uh, is the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes. And um, I believe that architects need to build empathy for their users in order to increase their quality of life. Uh, it is important to understand how the user feels when interacting with a certain uh, the, uh, built environment. Uh, as you know, uh, also architects uh, spend time getting to know the user and understand their needs, wants, objective. This means observing uh, and engaging with people in order to uh, understand them on a psychological and emotional level. In other words, I may say that uh, to promote and to ensure health equity, we need an inclusively designed cities. Um, I have a lot of things to share with you uh, because um, this uh, uh, this thought and this um, uh, strategies uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, is a very big uh, strategies and thinking. But uh, I should respect to my uh, time uh, and uh, want to finish my words with an other uh, researchers, Davis and Lipsius uh, statement. They said that uh, access for disabled people should not be viewed by architect as constraint on architectural design, but should be conceived of as a major perceptual orientation to humanity. I believe that universal design is for healing the world. Uh, this architecture thinking is like my uh, North Star. I believe that the inclusive design principles will continue to support and inspire architecture world for designing more livable uh, and more healthy environment in the near future too. Thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, inviting me. And thank you, Nilay, for your presentation. And uh, now I would like to ask all questions to uh, Julie. 
Hello, thank you very much, Meryl. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here with everybody today. Um, and I will just share my screen with you all. So um, I too would like to acknowledge the Ghana people on whose land um, uh, I am presenting from here in South Australia and respectively acknowledge them as the traditional lands of traditional owners of the lands. One of the gaps in architectural history, understanding and archives is that too often architect design buildings have been assessed from an aesthetic or stylistic perspective without a full understanding of other rationales behind their designs. However, it can be seen in a building's design for health that the foundations of their planning, aesthetics, services and materials were generally related to understand, understandings of medical theories and treatments common at the time of conception. By using architectural collections, including plans, photographs and publications, one can discover much about the ways people and their illnesses were perceived and treated and how buildings were intended to work to improve the health of the users or inhabitants. By better understanding buildings, we may be able to better reuse them or adapt them to our current purposes. And importantly, by exploring the, the inequities of the past through buildings, we can aim, hopefully, not to repeat them. Since the late 20th century, historians have been exploring different histories of place, um, places designed for health, debating whether they improved the lives of the inhabitants or oppressed them. In particular, asylums, sanatoria, quarantines, and leprosaria have been singled out for censure. However, critiquing architecture through judgment of what occurred within the walls can also be problematic. Therapeutic buildings and their grounds use various mechanisms to enable health and treatments. Among these were isolation, social segregation, access to clean water and fresh air, and recreation, occupation and exercise. All these produced and reproduced the contexts and thus the health inequities of the societies in which they were applied. Today, I'm going to focus on the way classification, in particular binary classification systems, such as healthy and sick, male and female, dirty and clean, were embodied in the buildings designed for the treatment and the way these reinforced inequities through bricks and mortar of our world. Please note that the language and the terminology used to discuss people with health problems in the past was often derogatory, offensive and stereotypical. And as a historian, of the terms and phrases that were applied can be seen as evidence of the attitudes of the time as well. The separation of different social classes has impacted on the lives of individuals and the health of the populations significantly through time with the singling out and isolating of those who were feared because they were ill or afflicted with disease occurring through the ages. Socioeconomic, racial and gender-based and age characteristics were other layers of classification also used to differentiate, differentiate people and the care they received in these amenities. Um, which they had access to, something that can be read from the plans of buildings literally um, written in the room's names. By exploring this, we may be able to reflect on our own ideas and around labels and room names and see how these um, made concrete um, and perpetuated inequities. The ability to physically segregate or separate classes of people and objects has long been one of the defining characteristics of architecture. Walls, doors and fences crystallise ideas into physical space. Rules and regulations indicated by signs, locks and keys and gatekeepers allowed certain groups access to spaces to the exclusion of others. Differentiated entranceways and separate quarters for men and women, first and second class patients and services and amenities that were differentiated on the basis of a patient's class, race and gender and ethnicity as distinct from any medical rationale, were features of many health-related buildings of the past. However, separation of individuals was medically advised. Placing physical 
distance between sick people and places and those who were healthy as one of the ways seen to halt disease transmission, something we've all had first-hand experience of during COVID. Quarantine stations were the architectural barrier to epidemic outbreaks and functioned to examine, quarantine, isolate, disinfect and treat travellers and cargo in order to contain infectious diseases such as plague, cholera and yellow fever. And here we can see the quarantine station in Sydney, Australia, which had separation between the healthy and sick grounds, surrounded by fencing, with guards employed to patrol the border. But by the 1880s, wealthy passengers were accommodated in a separate enclosure, which was also fenced. And in the early 20th century, additional accommodation blocks and separate kitchens and ablution facilities were built for those classified by authorities as Asiatics, replacing tent accommodation they had previously used. The classification and separation along lines of healthiness, socioeconomic status, gender, marital status and race introduced further needs for distinct and separate buildings and compounds, leading to a village-like appearance of small buildings scattered across the site. People suffering from disfiguring diseases such as Hansen's disease or leprosy, were also often shunned and isolated by society. And segregation was reinforced by legislation um, and was used as an instrument to forcibly isolate them in the 19th and 20th centuries. Religious orders had a tradition of caring for those with leprosy in institutions separated from the general population a tradition they continued even after the discovery that the disease was caused by bacteria with a low level of contagiousness. Such separation of people along lines of gender and race was additionally seen to have eugenic implications as well. In 1907, a purpose-designed lazarette was opened on Peel Island in Queensland. The government felt that it was essential to have separate compounds to segregate the coloured from the white the male from the female, as well as the isolation of facilities for the sick. And consequently, eight foot high chain wire fences bounded the different areas. The accommodation of the huts for the white patients were, and I quote, lined with ceilings and ventilated with a French light and a large window and furnished with a four post bedstead, table, chair and chest of drawers. By contrast, the huts for what were termed the coloured patients were constructed of rough timber framing clad with tea tree bark, low ceilings, an earth floor and accommodated more than one patient. When numbers increased, tents were used for sleeping quarters and extra, quote, coloured patients. And in 1908, with the deterioration of the bark cladding, corrugated iron sheeting was substituted. The difference in design and quality was clearly apparent. The act of isolating people was also applied to those with mental illnesses. Brislington House, England was built in 1804 and was a private asylum for pain patients. Separation through the construction of seven blocks, seven buildings, each with their own walled outdoor area or airing court, allowed for classification and separation by gender and socioeconomic background but also for the short-term segregation based on behaviour. This plan shows these categories in ink on paper, reflecting the intentions of the asylum and leaving a trace of the use for the building for historians to read. In conclusion, what I've aimed to show in this brief talk is how architectural records and artefacts from which social and cultural histories can be read um, can be used, including the plans, photographs and publications. We can discover much about the ways people and their illnesses were perceived and treated and how inequities were able to be reinforced through buildings. This hopefully has shown how archives can inform teaching and practice of architecture, as it is through looking at architecture of the past that we can actually hold a lens up to ourselves and our own ideas and hopefully move in a different direction. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And uh, Kadesh, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Okay, thank you for inviting me uh, before and uh, uh, nice to meet you all uh, the participants for the, for the panel. Um, I'm sharing. Um, okay, um, I, I will, I'm going to tell a short story of an old building, uh, which we, uh, a simple building, which we transform into a surgical instrument and health museum uh, in Samsung Black Sea region. This is the Samsung, uh, is a, uh, the Black Sea region of the Turkey, and uh, the building is in the on uh, the uh, seafront and uh, very close to the city center and um, th this is the uh, the building is taken uh, a picture from the 2008 uh, it is a, a wagon repair workshop uh, building is a train wagon repair workshop building as so needed to be restored uh, in the in the time and uh, this is the, another picture in the in a, another view so the this is the Samsung administration offers uh, to make this building uh, serve as a surgical instrument museum because there are plenty of surgical uh, instrument company which are produce surgical instrument in the Sam uh, and export worldwide in Samsung. So in this way, uh, th these are the some of the uh, the surgical instrument company that I put uh, in here, and. Um, in this way, the aim was to introduce the local people to the sector uh, uh, that provides significant economic uh, contributions to the city and uh, about health equity and the public health uh, and to bring uh, the people together, uh, which, which are professional together and uh, uh, about in this subject. So uh, during this uh, process the restoration has began and uh, we uh, were prepared that we started to uh, working on the exhibition or, or on the museum project so however uh, when we started working uh, the administration uh, the has uh, changed so uh, therefore, we did not uh, have any inventory data or any collect, co collecting uh, co artifacts and anything about the exhibition. So uh, we, we re uh, started the research for collections and the documents uh, for the exhibition uh, set up and where we aim to develop a historical perspective on the topics of health equ equity and the public health. So we reached uh, a person that uh, name is Haluk Park is uh, the one of the important collectors, collector of uh, uh, archaeological collector in Turkey, and uh, he agreed to exhibit uh, his important healthcare collection for this museum and for this purpose. So uh, the the main thing is uh, we uh, try we. Uh, uh, offer to use the uh, the middle of the buildings. The, in the middle of the building, there is a wagon repair ditch. So uh, we uh, we transform that uh, characteristic feature of this building uh, from its previous use into uh, into exhibition. So this is the the main topic of the exhibition. The kind of a timeline is the history of the uh, surgical instrument and its um, uh, its, its documents and uh, some artifacts and we uh, offered uh, an, a kind of a main exhibition uh, in there and uh, the other uh, the side exhibition in uh, we distributed around uh, around the, uh, this main uh, exhibition main uh, spine we call this as, as a spine. You can see the, the old photo of the ditch in there. So it's a, a different use, but we 
protect uh, the this stitch and the uh, use as a main exhibition line. So uh, the other areas uh, we transform in the different thematic exhibitions is uh, like uh, including, uh, uh, I mean, very wide range uh, artifacts from uh, very, uh, like uh, from the uh, Anatolian civilization to the Roman uh, period and uh, from industrial revolution pieces from the uh, documents to the Ottoman period is a very wide range of uh, artifacts we uh, found from the collection uh, collecting uh, collectors and this is the uh, the distribution of the function is a uh, main exhibition area is a like um, history and development medicine surgical instrument produced in Samsung eye surgery dental surgery gynecology doctor research room patient care rooms so we uh, did not able to uh, to put the, all this kind of artifacts in the area but uh, it, because of some issues but the general is uh, is done uh, the upper level is uh, is about the storage uh space technical room management office foyer and auditorium uh, this is all the exhibition uh you can find in the ground level so i want to show you the some example of uh the uh from the collectors uh artifacts and that we use in the exhibition and uh, for example there's a, a dentist chair in there and uh, this uh, some uh collecting uh, from the old time uh, in the Samsung area uh, when they produce the use for production to the surgical instrument. There's a, uh, you can anatomy uh, documents from the Ottoman period. This is a very unique example of the uh, uh, artifacts in the exhibition. This is the uh, important thing for uh, to show. Uh, what I wanted to show you to about the health equity in the past, uh, to understanding the health equity in the past. Uh, this is uh, th there is a, a watch uh, in there. It's designed for uh, b blind individuals uh, to understanding the time. And uh, the second, there is a documents in the middle. Um, of the screen, there's uh, you can see there's some alphabets uh, that uh, uh, develop for uh, to understanding uh, uh, the uh, disabilities. And the uh, the right in the pictures, this is I think the uh, 16th or 15th century, uh, the Ottoman period is uh, shows uh, is eye surgery uh, how they do this. Uh, this is important to tell the people uh, the history and the documents uh, what we have in the uh, public health in the past and now to discuss about uh, to, to compare the, the time. This is important. This is the main structure that you can use. See the uh, the section in here, and uh, we support the exhibition with the uh, digital. Uh, uh, immersive uh, narratives and the, the, some games, uh, etc., and the documents and the artifacts, and you understand, you try to understand the history of uh, uh, surgery and the, uh, for everything. But in here, uh, in for the opening, uh, the we yes, uh, the, the this section is the uh, you can see the ditch and the, how we uh, set the all the exhibition up to the, uh, the in the main area and you can see the site exhibition thematic exhibition in there so the uh, the, the main things in here uh, i will show you that some photos from the uh, the recent photos of the uh, the museum this is very simple and you can see the the disabled uh the the production of the, from the past uh in the exhibition and this is important for i mean uh, to support the disabled people they uh wanted to uh, open with uh this kind of um artifacts they choose the, this kind of artifacts to show and uh, you can see the the main axis in here and uh this is uh, what we 
what we did in the exhibition. So uh, we couldn't do the, all the things. Like uh, we believe that the, the several exhibitions should be developed in here and updated uh, in uh, in the context of the public health and the, for everything. Uh, but uh, the museum management, we believe, uh, need to uh, put some uh, topics for like a, uh, the climate crisis in here because the, it's very connected with the, uh, the public health and the impact of agriculture, uh, the effect energy production, water res resource consumption, migration, food security, and the rights of uh, future generation which is very related to uh, the health equity and the public health. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, the some photos from the exhibition. Uh, that's all uh, I hope uh, I put the, uh, the exact timing. Thank you, Kadir, for your answer. And uh, now uh, we have a question and answer and discussion uh, session. Uh, we have question and answer uh, and discussion session. And um, in our chat box, we would be very happy uh, to get uh, the questions by our audience. And before that, uh, I would like to ask uh, one more question to each panelist with respect to their uh, expertise fields and studies. Uh, for our limited time, I would be happy if your answers uh, take uh, two or three minutes uh, maximum. And uh, I would like to begin uh, with Julie. And uh, Julie, uh, as an architectural historian, uh, creator, and uh, active researcher, you, ha you have several publications, and including climate, uh, which is among top urgent and global, global issues and very uh, related to uh, health equity. And what would be your suggestions for collaborations between teaching and archival communities in architecture to develop historical documentation on climate justice with an emphasis on health equity, such as historical documentation on climate responsive architecture design for underserved, underrepresented communities, etc. I would be happy to know your answer. Thanks, Meryl. Yeah, I think um, we can learn a lot from looking at the history of climate, health and architecture, all, all three of them simultaneously as well. In the past, climate and health were linked very closely in people's minds, um, as was um, architecture and climate in terms of the response of architecture to different climates. And while access um, uh, to what were seen as healthy climates um, uh, really left populations in general at the mercy of their geographic regions. It can be seen that throughout history, the ability to moderate these effects of climate um, have always been influenced by social um, and cultural factors. Indeed, it's really only through exploring um, history and archives that we've um, been able to recognise these kinds of changes. And in the case of climate change, um, which is impacting us now, it's by comparison um, of climate data held in archives, as well as you know ice cores, that we've actually been able to understand that this indeed is a real thing that is happening. So I think the, the importance is archives is that we can actually mo monitor change through archives. Without that, um, we can be sometimes basing it on other things. So I think I, that's one thing. Um, and the access to healthy climates for human life can also um, be seen to be dependent on these social factors I mentioned. With the wealthier people, um, for example, often moving to areas um, with a more moderate climate. For example, um, uh, during summer, wealthier people tended to go to their homes along the coast or up in the hills where it was a bit cooler and there'd be sea breezes and things like that. So the health facilities for these um, richer climates were often situated in gardens, um, in natural environments, in well-designed buildings and landscapes. So it's important for us then to use that lens once again to reflect back on our own practices and our own teaching. Um, so if we can recognise these differences which occurred in the past and interrogate our own designs, 
looking at these things, we might be able to enable a more equitable way of designing um, going forward. So I think it's that recognition and interrogation of our own practices that history and archives can actually um, lead us to do. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to continue with uh, Kadir. In relation to his experience uh, uh, on health museum and teaching, what would be his suggestions to connect health museums in architecture education and interior design education today with a focus on health equity? Because in particular, Kadir has an experience as an instructor in interior design as well. So interior design and architecture disciplines, their connections are very vital for our post-pandemic uh, healthy uh, life. What would be uh, his suggestions? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I can... Um explain uh, i mean uh, some of this uh, under few topics maybe uh, this the the interdisciplinary team uh, the building is uh, very important i think uh, because we are um, working on in interdisciplinary and the uh, the students must be learn more uh, uh, working with the inter interdisciplinary ways. Uh, this is important. Um, and uh, one, one is the sharing the data and research, uh, which is very important. Uh, maybe is a, uh, uh, there could be an open source uh, data collections and uh, everybody can reach on them. And because the generally, uh, we can reach uh, everything about the architecture, uh, architectural uh, text or uh, some lots of data in everywhere in social media. But in the uh, in the context of the health equity or the the public health and uh, for everything, it is uh, I think it's a, a bit lack of uh, uh, not so much uh, data for to collecting th this kind of things. And uh, maybe uh, it can be designed uh, a, a, a in between spaces. Uh, I, I don't know how, but uh, we are thinking on uh, this kind of works. Uh, the people can come together in this space. Not It is not like a, uh, a school or not a, a individual uh, offices or something. Uh, this is a kind of a common public places, and the people can come together in there. And from the uh, from different professions, from the health professions, from the scientists, uh, some people who work on the climate crisis, and uh, some right. activists or something, and the, with the architecture students or uh, teaching assistants and prof professors uh, from the architecture, and come together and to make. Uh, can produce more uh, different ideas about this subject, I think. Yes. Thank you, Kadir. I think in architecture uh, for health equity, we need a much more holistic uh, and uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary understanding for a healthier uh, built environment, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, I, I agree with this. And the, we, uh, we had a different work uh, on the Istanbul uh, in uh, maybe you heard in Muse Gassani. It is a, uh, the main topic is the climate crisis in there. Inside uh, is a climate museum, but the other uh, the functions are the supporting the climate uh, museum because it is a uh, the climate crisis is related for every everybody because it is uh, a global thing. So. Uh, the people uh, shares uh, everything, what they produce, uh, get together and uh, uh, pro produce an idea in there that we try to create some spaces like this. Thank you. Thank you. Kader. And now uh, I have a question for Nilay. And uh, Nilay, in one of your recent published interviews, Architecture as a Tool for Inclusion in this year, uh, you have been saying that even architecture professors said that 
disabled people were not a significant target for architects when you started uh, teaching universal uh, design. Uh, first, I think that this uh, sentence is very important for us why we should push education uh, system uh, for inclusive design for health equity and for other uh, issues uh, with uh, perspectives on equity and my question is uh, what would be your suggestions for a more inclusive and responsive curriculum in architecture including health equity in Turkey today in particular by considering the covid-19 pandemic experience climate emergency and in particular by considering for instance recent earthquake in a country what would you like to say about that with a focus on health equity teaching and or today uh, current challenges uh, thank you Mera, for uh, for this question uh, uh, as i uh, told you in my lecture in my speech uh, i believe that universal design is for healing the world that's why um, i i give uh, the, the, this uh, the, um, lecture to interior design and architecture design students in the faculty. And uh, as you uh, told me uh, previously, uh, and uh, I believe also uh, we should create a, a holistic uh, view in design and uh, we should uh, try to understand um, um, what is normal. Uh, I mean, we should um, think about the uh, users, user-friendly uh, design, but uh, diverse users needs, wants, and uh, um, uh, details we should understand and give the um, uh, information to our students. Um, in another terms, maybe I can say, uh, if uh, we, we do not see the uh, problem, we cannot fix it. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, we should create uh, an empathy uh, as uh, underlined in my uh, lecture as well. Uh, we should not neglect uh, this reality. If, if, we, if we couldn't uh, create empathy, uh, we cannot do anything. Some people uh, will stay always segregated. Um, like this panel, um, we should make uh, more uh, get together. This is a good opportunity, I think. Uh, but uh, we need uh, our students as well. Right now, we are talking as a professional and as um, educator or uh, uh, as um, um, practitioner, practitioner, uh, architect uh, right now. Uh, if uh, this kind of uh, seminar uh, motivation, um, I mean, um, aims and motivation uh, increase, uh, this will be helpful for students as well, I think. Um, um, I th <laughs> this, is, this is all right now. Okay, thank you. And uh, Aaron, I have a question for you and you have um, a strong industrial link uh, teaching with a focus on design for health and well-being in architecture i would like to ask what was your motivations for industrial link teaching with a focus on uh, health and well-being um, have you noticed some gaps and what are its benefits for uh, teaching in architecture to gain uh, knowledge on health equity uh, with respect to or current challenges uh, such as pandemic, climate crisis, and uh, some problems with uh, food systems, uh, renewable energies, etc. And what would you like to say that briefly? Um, uh, thank you for the question, Morale. And uh, as you said, I do a lot of industry leaked teaching um, involving industry partners and real world projects in the architecture studio wherever possible. Um, it brings with it many challenges, but I think one of the major benefits of bringing industry in is that it uh, functions as that link between teaching industry and research practices. 
and the exposure in our industry partners have to new ideas and opportunities for uh, thinking differently about some of these healthcare projects or a, in any of the fields where we're working. So uh, we also work in uh, some of those other areas around uh, uh, natural disasters, uh, food systems, those types of things. But by bringing the industry in, we almost give industry license to uh, do things differently because they're engaging with students, they're engaging with academics. And one of the things I'm really keen to pursue further is how we can use some of these uh, industry links to encourage greater documentation of projects. And so we can start to build the archives of the future around some of our attempts to um, engage with underserved communities or to bring new voices in. Um, I think, as Julie mentioned earlier, archival documentation is really our shared memory. And um, I think the, the connection between uh, our large student cohorts um, and our teaching practices and some real world projects provides a really unique opportunity to have just a sheer workforce to document a lot of what's going on and a lot of the discussions that are being had when we are uh, actually going out and engaging widely with a lot of communities. And I think that's really how we can, as uh, Nilea mentioned, uh, connect with the empathy that we're building, connect with the lived experience and actually uh, provide a record of that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has tried to find documentation of um, past projects and how they've engaged with communities, but it's very, very hard to find anything other than the building as evidence. Um, those processes are almost entirely lost. And so I'd, I'd set a challenge to this panel or to people watching to actually see an archive as archiving processes, as well as archiving the physical footprint that's left behind, whether that's health equity or some of our uh, other areas around climate emergency, national disaster, natural disasters or food security. All of those things, I think we need to get better at documenting and archiving our processes as well as the artifacts that we kind of produce at the end. Thank you, Aaron. And finally, uh, I have a question for Elke. Uh, dear Elke, uh, in addition to your teaching and research collaboration efforts on equitable spaces within health, um, as far as I know, in June 2020, you also defended your PhD dissertation uh, in architecture uh, on health promotive building uh, design. So in light of your PhD experience, in particular in June 2020, in other words, uh, during the pandemic, it's very important for us, a PhD on health and architecture. Uh, very briefly, what uh, would you like to say about the role of PhD dissertations in architecture today and PhD programs uh, to understand health equity deeper and to enrich our perspectives, teaching and to enrich our perspectives, perhaps the uh, historical documentation collection criteria, et cetera. Very briefly, please. Yeah, uh, so much to say, but I think um... What I loved about being able to do my PhD in a in a very in Chalmers University that is quite close to practice. It was a topic, sort of the the bigger topic was posed by the municipality and the the local governments responsible for healthcare and health equity. So being able to work on issues that were actually present and deep dive into things uh, as a PhD was amazing. I was lucky that I had both a supervisor. That was a architect construction engineer as well as a nurse professor in nursing sciences which you also saw on the aaron davis slides marie elf and that also made it beautiful that i got to talk to her phds uh, that were on the nursing school so i was in the architecture school so within our little bubble we became that interdisciplinary group um, talking about these issues and their perspectives on what space and, and place is and versus what I, yeah, how I experience it as an architect and my role in that. Um, we also had quite discussions about who is supposed to be researching what. Should I even be doing interviews with healthcare professionals if I am not one myself? Do I understand them well enough? But I think there was also a value and we could see that that's 
the the kind of questions that I would ask would be different, and the kind of things that I would hear would be different. And I was lucky that I, throughout my PhD, I was uh, teaching constantly in these topics. So with the students, I could lecture my first outcomes, but also hear what did they actually hear or what kind of design implications did that did they develop? And so this constant interaction was uh, amazing. And um, yeah, you could see that right now the topic due to COVID, uh, whereas in the start, I needed to explain this to people why it's important. And I don't need to explain it so much anymore to the general audience. And there is much more interest from students also to, to study in this direction and not just the master, but like, um, yeah, really get into the depth of the topic. Yeah, is that... Uh, Okay, thank you. So is there any question from our audience? Okay, I would like to ask a question from Kadesh, the question by uh, Nasim. Uh, when visitors enter the museum, will they find any information about the history and previous use of building? Does the museum provide any exhibits or displays that share the story of the building's transformation into a health-focused museum? Kadir, what would you like to say that? Enter the museum will be fine. Um, yes, uh, they do. Uh, they, the visitor can find uh, a small uh, information about the building and um, uh, what is used for before and um, then uh, uh, just the health focused museum uh, the the exhibition is about the health focused museum and uh, but uh, you can you can find the uh, information about the building uh, and uh, what is used for before. Just I can say this. Thank you. But it's a, it's a, not a main uh, main information or main exhibition thing in the museum. Thank you. Any question? I, I have a question that I would uh, like to ask. Um, this is uh, the question for me. Because if you are including the community in evaluating spaces, uh, designing projects, sharing their experiences about using health-centered architecture, quite often people will be more aware of the aspects of the design that are causing challenges or impediments to them or excluding them. Uh, and they will be more able to discuss that than they will uh, be able to make observations about the aspects of the design that are more successful. For example, the the lighting or the access to fresh air, they might not notice it as, as much uh, if, they, if you sit them down and ask them to reflect on spaces. So how can you as practitioners and archivists uh, take that knowledge about perspective and use that in your uh, in your research and your practice. Um, I can say um, we uh, I mean uh, we are not expert for everything, so we uh, we are dis uh, working with the interdisciplinary uh, uh, way in uh, in this kind of works as a uh, I mean especially in the museum. Um, we have uh, um, some expert the professionals about, the, for example, in here, uh, the, there, there was no uh, professional uh, in the beginning about the health or something. So we need to explore research about the to understanding what we will do about. Uh, so uh, the uh, for this museum, uh, there is a health administration in the city, and uh, uh, from there, uh, there are some professionals that uh, give some advices uh, and uh, uh, some briefings and uh, uh, 
some information about uh, what we are doing or in the or uh, about the exhibition. Uh, in the other way, uh, the, it depends on the project. But in here, uh, we find. Uh, we found uh, uh, a collector, and uh, we um, we met with the collector, and he he has three books about the uh, the health collections, and uh, very interesting. There there are lots of collections from the antique co uh, collections from uh, the Anatolian civilizations and everything. So uh, he helps us to. Uh, to making documentation uh, for the museum and for everything. This is uh, this is the other side. This is the exhibition thing. Uh, but uh, in the same time, we had some expert uh, 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 experiments that work with the uh, um, the, uh, the lightning design and the, some uh, for we work with the um, uh, the art. Um, digital art uh, uh, artist uh, in installation that uh, do something uh, lots of works from the all over the world and uh, we uh, we work with uh, uh, some projects in individual projects and uh, we come together and we produce something uh, as uh, for the for the just for the project but uh, what we work on I can see this. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think uh, we are getting close to the end of our time together. And uh, I think that uh, all panelists today present their presentation uh, show, have shown us that health equity is a multidimensional concept and demands a uh, holistic perspectives. And uh, firstly, we need to create, I think, much more inclusive opportunities to actively listen uh, to disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, communities and to connect them, to learn their current struggles and expectations for health equity within the post-pandemic built environment. And I think that today, more than discussion, it's time to take collaborative actions with effective uh, methods. And secondly, I think that in architecture teaching, we should listen to the teaching community to learn how they identify gaps within this context. What are their current effective strategies to integrate health needs of disadvantaged communities into their courses, into their pedagogy, and what are their invisible or visible obstacles within education? And um, in architectural teaching, I think we should listen to the teaching community to learn how they identify, identify gap, gaps within this context and what are their current effective strategies to integrate health needs of disadvantaged communities into their courses and pedagogy. And thirdly, uh, we need to revisit our collective memory on health equity in architecture to support teaching, research, and uh, learning uh, communities in the field. In other words, architecture archives and collections. And finally, at that point, I would like to share a few critical issues in relation to my own experience. And according to my archive research, uh, archive-based research studies in architectural, uh, her story from the United States perspective at leading schools of architecture. Firstly, there is a huge gaps in their architectural archives and collections on underrepresented minority and immigrant communities and individuals from their own past past in spite of all critical discussions on inclusion and equity in American architecture today. And secondly, it is impossible to reach data on their diverse contents in architectural archives uh, at schools of architecture in the United States. In other words, we do not know how diverse their contents and thirdly, it is impossible to reach data on diversity in their archival and curatorial teams. In other words, we do not know who have been creating and developing these architectural archives at leading schools of architecture. So we need the data. And uh, from current pictures, um, I 
it's possible to say that architectural archives um, do not seem to be responsive to or uh, urgent needs uh, for teaching, researching, etc. And finally, during our panel organization uh, process, it has been a challenge for me to reach out to an archivist or a creator in architecture working on health subjects in spite of this uh, so discussions on these topics. I hope to Today, our panel can stimulate collective actions and collaborations among teaching diverse teaching archival and creatorial communities for health equity in architecture. And today, as the panel chair, it has been a pleasure for me to be all of you today. And I am thankful to everyone. And I wish we could meet uh, again at another event uh, to discuss uh, healthier architecture for all. My best wishes to everyone. And Angela, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Meral, and to Elke, Aaron, Milai, uh, Julian, and Kader for sharing your interesting projects and your insights on these questions. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, and we appreciate having you here so much. And I agree very much that I hope we can continue this discussion and that this inspires people to transform some of these thoughts into, into active practice. So thank you all very much. Great.